Well, hello, everybody. It's the uh, middle of the week, last week of July. It's hard to believe that uh, summer is getting past us. Uh, this Sunday is going to be August the 2nd, and I know a lot of people are asking questions about what we have planned for Sunday school. And to be honest, the one thing we have planned is uh, one large group adult Sunday school in the gym, socially distanced. And again, I'd like to encourage everybody to wear mask on your way in and way out but we'd love to have you come join us for an adult Sunday school the youth are going to meet downstairs uh, brother dwayne has been working hard to get preparation in the youth room and make sure the chairs are spaced out and again I just want to uh, let everybody know that we encourage you to come it's good God made us for fellowship God made us for worship uh, but if you're still concerned and uh, scared of uh, being out and about and catching something uh, I just encourage you to stay home then and to worship and watch us online. But Sunday school is going to be available uh, for adults in the gym at 9 o'clock, 9.15. The youth will be downstairs in their area, and the college kids are going to meet in 2.19 uh, downstairs below the gym. So those are the three things we have that we're going to initiate. This is almost like a phase two entering into uh, our try to be reestablished as a family of faith and to worship. Uh, things have been going fairly well uh, with our worship services on Sunday mornings. I wanna encourage you to continue to come if you can and uh, practice, uh, you know, just practice social distance. Just be, just be common sense. But you know, God made us to worship. Uh, I know that people are concerned about the suggestions that those who are above us in the government, what they have to say. And I just wanna remind you, as believers, we're not you know, God didn't call us to be troublemakers. However, God did call us to worship Him. You know, I've been going through the Old Testament, going through the study of Joseph, and I was reminded of something the other night when I was praying about uh, what we should do. And I was reminded that God spoke very clearly to uh, His prophet uh, Moses when He went and spoke to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh did not acknowledge God, did not submit to God, did not understand that there is a God who is higher and above Him. Dear friends, I just want to remind you, God has established different levels of authority. He's established first and foremost in the Garden of Eden. He established the unit of a family, uh, a mother and a father. They are to be the chief authority of the home. That's why children are supposed to honor their parents. They're supposed to respect and obey their parents. The family unit is the first establishment of authority. Then he established the congregation, the church, he, the called out ones, the people of God. And they are under God's authority. And so is a family, but the supreme authority is God. The church really doesn't, you know, the, the church's hierarchy is established in the scripture. Christ is the head of his church. Uh, no president, no king, no governor, no senator, no congressman, no mayor is the head of the church. Uh, Jesus is the head of his church. And just like Yahweh told Moses to confront Pharaoh and said, let my people go that they may come out to the wilderness and worship. I just think that it's a high priority that uh, you understand that our priority as believers is to gather, to worship, to sing, to praise God, and to hear his word. So I encourage you to come and uh, not be fearful and just trust the Lord. Apply common sense. Uh, be Cleanse your hands, wear face masks in and out, but let's sing and worship and hear from God. The third level of authority is the government. And the government, according to Romans chapter 13, is for the establishment uh, of civil society. And it's to punish evil. Worship is not evil. Worship is good. God established the government to punish evil and to reward good. Read it. Romans chapter 13. That's the role of government. Government is not over the church. And so I know that we have made that line fuzzy, but there really was a reason why the Danbury Baptist wrote to Thomas Jefferson asking for there to be a wall of separation between church and state, and it was so that the state would not dictate to the church when and where and how they could worship. So just keep that in mind uh, and be encouraged, and don't be fearful of man uh, or the government. Uh, fear God, and you won't fear man. That reminds me of what I want to really speak to you about real quickly, and that is, please put it on your calendars. Please put it in your prayer journals to be preparing your home, your heart, and yourself for the planned revival that we have with Dr. Dean Hahn. It's going to be starting September 27th through the 30th. We're going to start uh, on the Sunday morning, 
and we're going to have each night, Sunday night starting at 6.30, Monday night at 6.30, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night at 6.30. And I'm just praying that God will break out amongst us. I pray that He would cause revival to come uh, to our hearts, to our church, to our community. And it just reminded me, you know, we need it. We need it. As the people of God, we need revival. You can't revive a dead person because they're already dead. Sinners need to be saved, but saints need to be revived. An outpouring of revival will result in God's people getting their hearts right with God, confessing their sins, confessing their disobedience and their indifference towards the commands of God and expectations of God and cause people to put the jersey back on, put their helmet on, put their pads and get on the playing field and engage in our culture and our communities as the people of God to shine in the midst of darkness. When we get our hearts right and we do that, we'll make a difference which will result in people being saved and drawn to the glory and the goodness of our God. But we have to be a people of God first. If we're just like everyone that we know around us that's lost, and headed to hell, if we have the same beliefs, the same values, the same ethos, if we are just like them, if we're no different than them, then there's nothing to compel them to want to worship the God that we know. So I just want to encourage you, you know, as we look at Psalm 51, I encourage you every week to be reading Psalm 51 and other revival passages, because revival starts with me. It starts with you. It starts with the individual. And it starts with us confessing uh, our sin and ag agreeing with God about what his word says about us. So just real quickly, uh, Psalm 51. This is how revival comes. It comes when God's grace confronts our sin, our selfishness, and our desire for autonomy out from underneath God's realm of authority. We don't want to, we don't want to be ruled by anybody, let alone a supreme being called God who is the creator of the universe, but yet we can't be happy and fulfilled and we can't overflow with the blessings of heaven if we don't submit to him, if we don't walk in humility and ask for his spirit to fill us. David had gotten to a place in his life because of his sin with Bathsheba, because of the things that had gone on in his personal life, because he was out of fellowship with God, sin entered into his life and it calloused his thinking and his feelings towards the things of God. And it wasn't until God sent Nathan the prophet to confront David with his sin that David was broken, repented, and we get to see his heart in Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is in the context of David being confronted by the truth of his sin and then comforted by the grace of God's forgiveness. So I don't have time to go through all of it right now, but I encourage you to read it. It starts out, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion, blot out my rebellion. You can't have, re you can't have revival in your heart, in your home, in our church, or in our country until we confess our sin, our rebellion, that we've resisted and resented God and we have put him off and we desire to do things our way and we want to dictate to God what he should do for us instead of reading his word, listening to the Holy Spirit, submitting to church and submitting to uh, our fellow believers and a body of believers being held accountable and say, this is what you ought to do. I mean, if resentment draws up into your mind and into your heart and you bow your back because someone tells you, you ought not do that or you ought to do this. And what they're saying is, to be in fellowship with God, you have to agree with God that what he says is right. When he says not to commit adultery, he means it. You can't commit adultery and be in fellowship with God. And it applies for any other sin list. Now, I just want to say to you, David was confronted with this. And he said, blot out my rebellion, wash away my guilt, and cleanse me from my sin. I'm conscious of my rebellion and of my sin. And my sin is always before you. Now, listen. Excuse me. My sin is always before me. David acknowledges that when he sinned, when he sinned against Uriah, one of his 70 warriors... He took Uriah's wife and he had relations with her and then lied about it. And then he had Uriah killed. He killed one of his most faithful warriors and then he covered up his sin and he didn't admit his guilt. 
But then when he's confronted, he says, God, it was against you. Did he sin against Uriah? Yes. Did he sin against the nation of Israel? Yes. Did he sin against Bathsheba? Yes. But ultimately, when we rebel, when we sin, we're sinning against God. And he acknowledges that. He said, against you and you alone have I sinned and done evil in your sight. And you are right to pass sentence on me. You are blameless when you judge. Many times when we feel convicted, we feel a sense of guilt and the Holy Spirit is using the word of God and the spirit of God comes upon us and brings conviction upon our soul. What we do if we don't submit to that conviction, what we do is we get resentful and we stiffen our neck and we resent God and we push away from God and we say, well, this just doesn't apply to, to me. It's okay for you, but it doesn't apply to me. That's the very person that needs revival. A person who's not submitting to spiritual authority and not under the authority of the Lordship of Jesus. You know what revival is? Revival is when you come to the place in your life when you submit every thought, every word, every deed, every attitude, when you submit to the authority of God. I may talk about more of this next week, but would you please... Begin to just think about your relationship with Christ. Do you honor God with your time? You know, I used to teach a study when I was in college, you know, based on uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, you know, if we were to sanctify our body, soul, and spirit, we would tie our time to God. We'd give God 2.4 hours every day. Now, that's hard to say to a people who don't even believe in tithing their money and their possessions and the fruitfulness of God's grace to them. It all belongs to God anyway. He says, I want you to test me in this tithe. You know, if you're, if you're not right with your wallet with God, you're not right with your heart to God. It's just that simple. Tithing is training wheels for a believer. This is the basics. This is just the beginning. You've got to get that right. Same way with baptism. You've been a believer, and the Lord Jesus said in Matthew 28, he said, if you profess me as Lord, you need to publicly profess that and be baptized, acknowledging that you have died to self and that you have placed your faith in me and that you'll be risen. Read Romans chapter 6. Read Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Baptism is for believers. And to be obedient to the Lord Jesus, if you believed upon him, you need to be baptized and follow the Lord in, in immersion that you can identify with him and then join a local body of believers where you can faithfully serve. If you're not doing these basic things, how is God going to trust you with bigger things? you got to be faithful and obedient in the little things. And th these are the basic instructions. And when I was a kid, Bible was the acrostics and joy club for basic instructions before leaving earth. Basic instructions before leaving earth. Listen, revival comes when you get your heart right with God, your mind right with God, and you walk with God. It's not just flipping a switch. It's a commitment and a submission and then asking for God's help, joining with a group of people who are fellow sojourners, fellow travelers on life's road, and we're not perfect, but we're being set apart and sanctified by the word of truth, by the spirit of God, and he is helping us to become a people who reflect Christ. Listen, we all need a lot of work. We all got a lot of room for improvement. But revival will help us to get there. And I just encourage you. You need a big shot of adrenaline to get you going again for worship in the Lord. Ask God to begin revival in your own heart. And then pray for corporate revival here at the Red House Baptist Church as we prepare for it on September the 27th through 30th. Listen, I hope this blesses you. I want you to be encouraged. I, don't, I want you to walk in joy and in fullness, and I want your faith to flourish. And in order to do that, you need to be uh, filled with the Word of God, filled with the Spirit of God, and filled with the fellowship of God. And if you do that, you'll experience revival, and your Christian life will show it. God bless you. Hope you have a great week. Be safe. Hope to see you Sunday at 1045. God bless you.